Okay. We're ready for First Peter chapter five. Let's uh, let's read the whole chapter, and then I'd like to uh, uh, do a little bit of introduction of what we're going to be talking about, and we'll concentrate on the first three verses today. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing to be but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you, all who are in Christ. Okay. I don't know about you, but it may seem a little odd. The first four chapters of this letter uh, seem to be talking about submission, seem to be talking about the persecution that's coming, seem to be talking about staying strong, and then all of a sudden he switches in the last chapter to talk about uh, elders and shepherds. During times of persecution, Christians need good leadership. And I don't think it's that strange when you consider the things that are going to be happening that it's just important that Peter spends a little time talking about where they can go for leadership. And in, in Peter's divine wisdom, the Lord was a uh, will, or excuse me, in, in God's divine wisdom, the Lord's will was to organize his church and to provide compassion and leadership, much like a shepherd over his flock. I want to read a passage in Matthew 9, 36. I don't know. I'll leave that there. Matthew 9, 36. This is, uh, this is Jesus. And starting in verse 35, it says, God was going, or excuse me, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. In verse 36, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. Did the children of Israel not have leadership? That's exactly right. They had leaders that, that didn't what? Well, they were greedy and wanting power. Uh, friendship with Rome, accommodation with the culture, the, you know, the people that would keep them secure. They were more interested in the trappings of the role, weren't they? They were more interested in, in, in being seen uh, by, by their fellow Jews as someone special. They were in it for the wrong reason, okay? 
We'll talk about that coming up. When Jesus saw what the people uh, looked like when he was here on earth, he described them as distressed or harassed or even thrown down or helpless, okay? Because they weren't able to get the kind of leadership that they deserved. So based on that, what would you say is God's will for local congregations of believers? This is a no-brainer, folks. You can't be in it for money, or...? You, we need good leaders, don't we? We need leaders that not only love the flock, but we need leaders that are in it because they want to be in it. And that's what Peter is going to be talking about that. Um, he talks in terms of uh, elders. We'll talk about what that means and the responsibilities to shepherd the flock. So Peter doesn't attempt, you may note in first three verses here, that Peter doesn't attempt to retain oversight authority. Peter was an apostle, wasn't he? I think it might have been within his prerogative to have said, you know, listen to me. I've walked with Jesus. I've heard his teachings personally. I know that he's a man, he is the son of God. He is, he is someone that, that we should look up to and emulate. And so Peter, to me, seems like he could have just as easily said, you know, listen to me. I got good advice for you. But he didn't, did he? What did he say? He said that from among you, there needs to be some leaders. And then he goes about to describe what these leaders should be thinking like and what these leaders should be doing and what, and what their motivation should be. So the church, as the proverbial sheep, are given the obligation to trust and submit to these leaders, aren't they? And, he goes on to say, later in the chapter here, later in this particular chapter, that we're to be on alert to resist the devil. Because the devil is prowling around looking for those to devour. My translation says in verse 2, Ken, nurture, guard, and guide, and fold the flock of God that is I, uh, I can't move around. Here's the command. I can't move that much. Okay. Yes. Yes. We are going to talk about that. We are going to talk because, to me, I know I don't know if if you see it, but these first three chat these first three verses of this chapter. Uh, put out an awful lot of information that we tend to kind of gloss over. So, Peter writes these instructions for elders who would serve as shepherds of God's flock. Where does he say these shepherds... Well, let me, let me wait a minute, I skipped something here. Um, what are the qualifications Peter has when he, to, to write the things that he writes? Let's look at verse 1. He's a fellow elder. Says he's a fellow elder. What else? He saw suffering. He is an eyewitness. Okay. And the third thing is, he is a partaker in the glory. Okay. In other words, he knows that this was the Son of God. He believes what he. He believes what he's getting ready to tell us. He is qualified. Uh, just by virtue of the fact he is an eyewitness. There is nothing better than an eyewitness when it comes to the truth. So he's coming, he's coming to them not, not as an apostle that is dictating what they should be doing. He's coming to them as a fellow elder. And I think there's a key there that, that we shouldn't skip over. Because Peter is, is not commanding these elders to step up, is he? He's not saying, you guys should know better. 
you need to get yourself some leadership in place right now. Instead, what's it say he's doing? He exhorts them. My, ver my, my, my version says in, in the very first line, I exhort the elders. There to present patterns and models of Christian living. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about what that pattern is based on. Gail. Was, was Peter an, an elder over any particular congregation? Or was he well, we're going to... We're, in a different sense than the elders that we're, care their own particular... We're going to pick about the terms here, but I think when Peter uses the term elder, he's referring to a mature Christian. I don't think he's referring to an office in the church at this point. He, you, were, you were asking, weren't you, about his eldership? Was he over the congregation? Yeah. And that, I, I was wondering about that, too. The commentaries I read didn't point out anything specifically in the Bible that said, okay, you know, Peter was over a congregation. Uh, he, um, he was yeah. he, yes. I was wondering if he was trying to keep those people together during that time of... I mean, he was the elders. Well, the the rest of the the rest of the world, the rest of the Christian world, kind of looked to the apostles as senior leadership. Okay, so it may be in that regard. The commentaries I read didn't say that he was a office holder in any particular city or congregation. So I think as a seventy-year child of God, and somebody new becomes a, a child of God, I think I might be able to advise them. Sure. I don't live properly. Sure. You should be able to. So I'm not a male, but I am elderly. Yeah, and the, the commentaries I read seem to think that the term Peter's using here for elder is a mature, uh, knowledgeable, spiritual uh, Christian. Okay, not necessarily an office holder. Okay. Doc. Peter was deeply concerned for every congregation that he had established. In rewriting to them, he always tells them he's praying for them. Yes. So the fact that he remembers them and prayed for them, that is sincere concern. Yes, yes, absolutely. So let's, let's take a look at this uh, first couple of verses here. Is it, so where are these elders supposed to come from? group he's talking to, aren't they? Okay. A little more specific, though. How does, how does he word it here? In verse 2, it says, Shepherd the flock of God among you. Now, what, what does that tell you? The elders came from among that group. Okay. And conversely, because you're an elder here, at Park Hills, okay. Does that give you any authority over, say, Farmington or Perryville or um, Detroit or St. Louis or anything like that? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. He, he is saying in here that your effectiveness as an elder, as a shepherd, is from the flock where you're from, where, you, where you're among. <laughs> No, no, what does that mean? What, what is, what's the connotation to that? Well, a few weeks ago, James had a lesson on mind your own business. <laughs> okay. If you mind your own business, you don't have time to mind mine. I think here is proving the local economy. Yes, yes. This is where this is where we get the idea of of local autonomous congregations. Okay. This is this is why when when you say appoint an elders from among you, there's there's a relationship. Okay. We listen to Mike. We listen to Dick. We listen to Paul. We listen to you because we know you. Okay, much like a shepherd, much like the descriptions in the Bible where the sheep know the shepherd and they trust the shepherd and they realize the shepherd is there for their protection and is there for their feeding, is there for their welfare. Okay, and so 
when Peter just, I mean, when you read these three verses, you think, well, yeah, I know that. You know, this is all stuff we, we're, we're all familiar with. But when you, when you start picking it apart, you see that there's a whole lot of meat in these verses, especially these first three verses. So the first thing he says is he, he, he wants these elders to be from among the community of followers. And conversely, like we mentioned here, that means that you have no authority over other communities of Christians. And to me, I see that as harmonious, okay? I see that as a way to minimize the disruptions, okay? If, uh, if you don't like what's going on in another congregation, you know, that's not your responsibility. That's why Paul said in there and keep the unity of the Spirit among the peace. That's, that's a very good way of doing that, okay? May I read you verse 3 of my translation? Why, sure. Not domineering or arrogant, dictatorial, overbearing person over those in your charge, but being examples, patterns, models of Christian living to the flock. Absolutely. Congregation. Absolutely. But before we get to three, let me say a couple more things about verse two. Okay? One of the things that this elder or overseer or um, shepherd that Peter describes here has to do with desires and needs. Okay? The desires of the flock should be considered, but the needs of the flock need to be more important to the shepherd. Now, why would I say that? Well, the elder is to serve willingly, not Absolutely. Willingly. Absolutely right. And he has to be aware of God's will. That's that, that verse in 2. It says he, he uh, not, serves not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. So that tells me that this elder should be aware of what the will of God is, right? That tells me that that elder should be familiar with what the scripture says, and in, in, in putting it in today is parlance, okay? That tells me that that person should be mature spiritually, should be aware of the fact that God, what God wants for the flock. Well, it means that if he becomes a child of God today, he doesn't become an elder tomorrow. That's right. That's right. Paul speaks also of not being a novice. And, and all of these traits, I mean, we, we're not, well, we haven't looked at Titus and Timothy yet. We may get to that. We may not. But <clears throat> all of these traits are important when you're dealing with people. Because people are hard to manage. People want things. People desire things. People, people want things done a certain way. And when and when you when you see the kind of leadership that Peter's describing here, that person should be more interested in the will of God, which is what the congregation needs, as opposed to the desires the desires of the congregation. Or the glory of the office. Or the glory of the office. Absolutely. Oh, the glory of the office. What do you think? That's pretty radical. No, it's not. <laughs> Where does the controversy come from from leading people when you don't give them what they want? About what they need, not what they want. That's why the need is more important. Yeah, Mike? You Paul, in his return, communicating with uh, every congregation, he reminds them over and over to remember what he has told them, to stay faithful to what he has told them. Don't let someone tell you otherwise. If they do, they are not your friend, in other words. In that, in, yes, in that situation, the things that Peter was telling them 
represent the kind of things we, we read about in the scriptures now. Because you, you, can't, just, you can't just write off to Amazon and, and log in and, and get a copy of the Bible sent to, you, to your home back then. The way you, you heard about what, what the will of God was was when an, an apostle came or a teacher and, and taught you and established congregations in that area. And so, yeah, he, he was trying to feed that flock. He was trying to provide sustenance to them so that they could be prepared for when, when the devil came around and, and uh, was looking to split them apart. All right. So let's get into, uh, well, wait a minute. I, st I think I still got a few more here. So what is Peter is Peter describing a person an office or a leadership style what do you think when he when he writes these verses let's just let's just concentrate on the first four, four verses here in particular the first three what is he writing is he writing about the office of elders shepherds overseers bishops is he writing about a leadership style? What about a combination of all? Very possible. Very possible. I think it's a relationship to the flock a lot. I think they were in very difficult circumstances where they weren't organized in buildings like we are. They were scattered in houses around, and so they were very threatened. I think it's a shepherd who's keeping a tight rein in a relationship with all of the people that are in that dispersion that Peter talks about earlier, maybe. There's, there's some bleed over into, into the office of, of elder, but I think the primary thing Peter's writing about here is a leadership style. Now, what do I mean by a leadership style? Inez is over here shaking her head. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you've met Peter in, excuse me, if you've met people in positions of leadership, like I have in my time in the Army, okay, I can tell you of at least three or four different leadership styles that can accomplish the goals, but they may not be the, the appropriate leadership style for that group of people, okay? If you're talking about the military that's used to do things my way, okay, or, you, or worse, <laughs> okay, then, then maybe the kind of leader that's dictatorial or leads from an expert position relationship might be the appropriate leader, okay? Do this. I know exactly what I'm doing. I expect you to be at this place at such and such a time. We're going to form up. We're going to get on the rail. We're going to load our vehicles on the railhead. We're going to ship from here to, to Florida. Then we're going to get on a ship, and then we're going to fly over there to, to Germany. We're going to be prepared to fight in seven days. Okay? You may like that type of leadership if you're in the military. All right. Here's another kind of leadership. We're all in this together. We're one big happy family. I'm looking for your input. You're looking for my input. We're all part of the team. We're all going to tug together. We're going to meet out front. We're going to go through calisthenics for, for 30 minutes this morning. And then after that, we're going to go just get together and sing a few verses of Kumbaya. And then we're just gonna we're just gonna go about our day with a big smile on our face and greet our customers on the phone. Happy, happy, happy! I've got this job. Did you see that style in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> and in between, there's other kinds of leaders. Okay. Why does he choose a shepherd style of leadership? Why do you think? Walk. Such, the yes. Elders. And everybody is to be an example to the flock. We to each other. Yes, yes. 
But why does he choose shepherd? Why, did, why didn't he choose, say, I don't know. Well, the shepherd looks after the whole flock, but if one of them strays away, he leaves the 99 and goes and search for that one. Absolutely. Which is what exactly, a shepherd is why Jesus, the analogy of Jesus. Ding, 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 ding. Look at verse 4. And the chief shepherd. She's reading it now. Appears to you, you will receive the glorious crown, which will never lose its brightness. And who is the chief shepherd? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So Peter is a witness of Jesus Christ. He saw how Jesus handled his leadership style. And I think he is writing here and he picks the term, he picks the, the, the leadership style as shepherd because... That's the leadership style of Jesus. He stopped and think about it. The verse we just read. He comes into, he comes into the, the town and he looks around and, and, and what is he? He's saddened. He's saddened because the people look like they're leaderless. They look like they're distressed. They look like they need some compassion. They need leaders who look out for them. Not leaders that tell them all these various mundane things to do. Okay, like the Pharisees wanted to do. So, he chooses a shepherd because Jesus is a good example of a shepherd style servant leader. Okay, and that's the style he's encouraging the elder leaderships to become. Um, we talked about uh, eldership denoting age and experience and spiritual maturity. The shepherd's style is one of caring for sheep, like Inez just read. He's, con he's concerned about the sheep. He's concerned about uh, the welfare. He's concerned about protecting them. And it goes back to, let's, let's just go back a couple chapters in, in 1 Peter 2, 24, excuse me, 25. He says, for you are, you are continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Okay? So they understand what a shepherd is. They understand how a shepherd operates. They understand the leadership style of a shepherd. And so he, he is using this analogy to try to get them to see that their leaders should be that style of leader. Now, other translations and other, other parts of the Bible, we've, we've got 1 Timothy chapter 3, we've got Titus chapter 1, they also use other terms for our leaders, don't they? Terms like overseer, terms like bishop. Okay. Are they different? There's different aspects to the office. Different aspects, such as? Well, for example... A shepherd is one who keeps sheep. Yes. Okay, so he treats the sheep in a reasonable way. Yes. But also he's the overseer, and so if they be attacked, he goes and takes care of that situation. He's a protector. Absolutely. I think you're right on target. He's, he's, these various terms come up in, uh, for the position of, of leaders in Christ's church because different flocks need different things, kind of like Bernie's saying. If you have a large flock, a large congregation, how important is delegation? How important is division of, of responsibilities? How important is, is uh, making sure that I don't know. The valet is out there parking cars. Kindly. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a lot of things. I don't, you know, most of you in this room are, are probably well aware of it here, but um, there's a lot of younger folks that don't know how how many things are involved in in just opening up for worship. Okay. If everybody so, does exactly the same thing. There's a lot of things that don't get done. That's right. That's right. Parking lots don't get scraped. Okay. Sidewalks don't get salted. Communion cups don't get filled up. You know. PowerPoint doesn't get loaded on the computer. The electric bill doesn't get paid. Okay. There's a lot of things that go on to, to operating a facility. Okay. Well, it sounds simple, but this, this 
even that. Could the have dignity to be out of it? So another person volunteered. Even even something even something that looks as simple as this is not simple. <laughs> okay. Don't ask me to do it. <laughs> but the difference between a shepherd and an overseer is 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 I think in terms of the size of the flock and what the flock needs. Okay. Different flocks are in different different positions. Okay, so I see a difference in the leadership style among these words. I see a shepherd as an encouraging leader who leads by example, uh, usually gently, but persistently and firmly. He's guiding and protecting the flock. I see an overseer more as an organized leader who would delegate and appoint sub-managers to accomplish certain goals set for the flock. But they all have one thing in common. They can't do it all. And the leaders need to learn how to get other people to pull together to accomplish the goals. And that's where the exhortation and encouragement comes in. We're out of time. We'll pick up there. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about Christ's example for leadership a little bit more and we'll tie it together with Peter. Thank you. We got a break next week, by the way. We've got uh, a speaker from the children's home next week.